We've talked a lot this week about the idea of economic development in general. Now I want to look at a specific case study of rapid economic development, that of the newly, newly industrialized countries, or NICs, and of South Korea in particular. Remember that the process of economic and political development, and more broadly, of state and nation building, had taken more than a thousand years in Europe. That process had been heavily influenced by warfare and had been legitimated through a number of factors ranging from ethnic ties, such as in the case of Germany, to the capacity of the state to deliver on economic and social development, as was the case in Britain. The fundamental problem was that the developing world was unwilling to wait a thousand years. By the early 1980s, it was clear that development had reached an impasse. Large numbers of developing countries had, despite massive intervention, been unable to address the political, economic, and social challenges they faced. But a ha small handful of countries, collectively referred to as the NICs, appeared to be doing quite well. Countries like South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore had managed to sustain steady economic growth at the same time that many others, such as Mexico and Argentina, had seen their growth rates start to stagnate. The obvious question was what they had done differently, and relatedly, how could other developing countries learn from the NICS success? This group of countries was referred, referred to as the newly industrialized countries. The earliest group of NICS, often referred to as the Asian Tigers, included Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, and South Korea. Other countries are sometimes included in a second generation of NICs. While they expressed considerable diversity, the NICs shared a number of common features that many observers came to associate with a NIC model. These features included a heavy commitment to securing economic growth, significant state intervention in the economy, but often informed by particular strategies of intervention, such as control over financial capital and protectionism for domestic industries, and a strong, often enlightened political leadership focused squarely on delivering on promises of economic growth. Let's consider the South Korean experience in more detail to tease out exactly what we mean by these. In 1910, Japan invaded the Korean Peninsula, occupying the area until they were expelled at the end of World War II. During their colonial occupation, Japan undertook a series of reforms, displacing local Korean landowners and replacing them with Japanese landlords. Koreans became tenant farmers. Koreans resisted Japanese colonialism largely through nonviolent avenues. It's important to note that while having a dramatic effect, the period of Japanese colonialism in Korea was relatively short, lasting just 35 years. As a result, Korean culture remained largely intact. At the same time, the displacement of Korean landowners by Japanese colonialism meant that after decolonization, land reform was a significantly less conflictual process. After World War II, Japanese rule on the Korean peninsula was brought to a close, but the peninsula divided into a communist back north and an American back south. As a result, the Korean War quickly broke out. Fighting raged from 1950 to 1954. At the end of the war, the peninsula remained divided into a communist north and a capitalist south at the 38th parallel, roughly the same point at which the war began. After the war, South Korea faced numerous challenges. It was devastated by war and colonialism. Its per capita GDP was just $87, one of the lowest in the world. It had few material resources of value, a low domestic savings rate, and a small domestic market. The challenges of economic development seemed insurmountable. A military coup in 1961 brought an ambitious young leader, General Park Chung-hee, to power. Interestingly, Park and the other coup leaders justified their intervention directly in economic terms. As Park himself stated, I want to emphasize and re-emphasize that the key factor in the May 16th military revolution was to effect an industrial revolution in Korea and deliver on the promise of economic growth he did. 
During Park's rule, South Korea experienced an average rate of economic growth of 9.2% per year, the highest in the world over that time. In real terms, South Korea's economy grew from a GDP per capita of $87 in 1962 to $1,500 by 1980, to almost $9,000 by 2001, and to almost $30,000 by 2011. South Korea's strategy of economic development during this period depended on a number of unique factors. First, the South Korean government promoted export-oriented industries and heavy industry. They engaged in widespread repression of labor movements and used protectionism to ensure that domestic markets did not face competition from foreign producers. The South Korean government also nationalized the banks and maintained control over the access to credit which it used to encourage the development of particular industries. Finally, South Korea made a tradition of large industrial conglomerates known in Korea as the Kai Bulls. What's most interesting about South Korea's model of economic development is the degree to which it does not confirm any traditional model of development. Rather, South Korea's experience points to a locally defined hybrid model that drew bits and pieces from a wide variety of theories and approaches without ever embracing one wholeheartedly. South Korea drew on the export-oriented model to promote particular industries, but it also drew on protectionist models and nationalized the banks. Perhaps above all, the South Korean model of development depended on a strong state. This was not a state that withdrew from the economy and permitted the market to dictate development as we sometimes see under liberalization. Rather, the South Korean government intervened in the economy in particular but often very powerful ways. The state control of access to credit, and it used credit to push companies in particular directions. It also controlled entry to the domestic market and imposed price controls on many goods. Yet Park was always very careful to remain comfortably within the American sphere of influence. Park described his system as a system of guided capitalism, observing that the principle of free enterprise and the respect for freedom and initiative of free enterprise will be observed, while also noting that the government will either directly participate or indirectly render guidance to the basic industries and other important fields. South Korea's developmental experience could thus be cast as a function of internal factors. It was rooted in a form of benign authoritarianism under which the state was willing to use its repressive features to ensure a compliant labor force and to promote particular forms of export-led development. But it's also important to keep in mind the broader international factors that contributed to South Korea's development. As a result of the desire to prevent the spread of communism, and as a function of the Korean War and ongoing tensions with North Korea, the United States has long maintained a close relationship with the government of South Korea. This translated into direct military and non-military aid to the South Korean government, and to preferential market access for South Korean producers into the United States. But more importantly, it also helped facilitate a permissive attitude on the part of the United States government towards the activities of the South Korean state. South Korea was thus able to engage in a wide variety of activities, such as nationalizing the banks, that the United States not only opposed when attempted elsewhere, but frequently actively intervened to stop. In Guatemala, for example, the United States supported the overthrow of the government of Jacobo Guzman in 1954 to present, prevent the nationalization of land belonging to the United Fruit Company. South Korea's dramatic economic growth was also accompanied by high costs, raising questions about the desirability of replicating the model. Workers in South Korea faced long working hours, and unions demanding better working conditions were violently repressed by the states. Activists were jailed, tortured, and even killed by the military government. At the same time, import restrictions raised the cost of consumer goods, reducing the overall quality of life for many South Koreans. There was little spending on social welfare to obviate low living standards. And the political system itself was fundamentally undemocratic. Indeed, while Park's reign ended in 1979, 
It was not until 1997 that South Korea experienced its first peaceful democratic transition from one elected government to another. And while South Korea's military government attempted to legitimate its rule by delivering on promises of economic growth, the broader question of whether economic development justifies political repression remained unanswered. Further, it's not entirely clear whether the South Korean model could in fact be replicated elsewhere. Are the features of South Korea's experience that could are there features of South Korea's experience that could be replicated elsewhere? Or was South Korea's developmental model a function of its particular history and a particular moment in the global political economy? Whatever the answer, it's hard to argue with the dramatic accomplishments of the South Korean economic model. While both North and South Korea were at roughly the same level of economic development in the early 1960s, today the per capita PPP GDP of almost $30,000 in South Korea is the 20, world's 27th largest economy. North Korea, by contrast, is among the world's poorest countries with a per capita PPP GDP of just $1,400. The satellite photo in this slide represents the differences between the two countries. South Korea, with its developed and diverse economy, is lit up. North Korea, continuing to rely extensively on subsistence producers and lacking many of the trappings of the modern economy, remains firmly in the dark.